I'm going to start off by just talking a little bit about 1789 and then I'm going to pass it over to the three mentors that are with us today, Ford, Patrick, um, and Myra, and they are going to introduce themselves, tell all of the students a little bit about uh, their background and what it is that they could chat with students about at 1789 in a mentor capacity, what are some different things that they could help you all with. And so while they're running through that little intro about themselves, I encourage you students to jot down as many questions as you can think of. These questions could be for career advice, they could be recommendations related to school, they could be recommendations related to your own venture or even something personal um, so I will ask the mentors to keep their answers to around two minutes or so. If you start chatting too long, you won't be able to get to as many questions. And um, I will encourage students, if you're a quiet student, generally, to challenge yourself to um, step forward and ask a question. And if you always ask questions, I would challenge you to uh, potentially step back and wait for some quieter students to ask questions. Uh, the way we're gonna keep an order to questions is you're going to raise your virtual hand and you can do that by pulling up the participant list. If you click participants at the bottom of the screen and then under the list of all the participants, you should be able to raise your virtual hand. So I'll see your hand raised and then I'll call on you and then you can go ahead and introduce yourself and ask your question. It could be for one of the mentors or it could be for all three of the mentors, um, whatever you feel like doing. Um, so to get started, for those of you that don't know, 1789 is a venture lab and a community, a network of students interested in innovation entrepreneurship. Uh, you'll find all the mentors that we're chatting with, except for Ford, because he's new and I still need to update this website, um, under the resources tab at 1789hub.com. And you can see their various um, areas of expertise and you can also learn more about each of them, get a little bio by clicking the link in there as well. Um, make sure you check out the other things on the resource tab. Just a plug for the 1789 Student Venture Fund that will be opening again um, right around the start of classes. It will be open for three or four weeks. So if you are a student venture that needs some funding or you know a student venture that needs some funding, um, please check this out, read about the criteria on this website and submit an application. Um, if you have any other questions, shoot me an email. I think a lot of you have been to 1789 and other Meet the Mentor sessions, so we won't spend too much time on that. Um, so let me pass it over to the mentors. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what areas of expertise you can help students with at 1789. Um, Patrick, you want to start? Guess I was muted. Yeah, I can, I can start. So, uh, yeah, Patrick Castian, I've been with um, Innovate Carolina for, let's say about three years now, starting, just starting my fourth year. Um, been a mentor at 1789, basically from the start. And Kimmy, you would have to remind me when we actually started the mentoring program through 1789. Um, but what I do as a research analyst with Innovate Carolina, I work with all of our students, faculty, and staff across campus on um, helping them determine whether or not what what they're working on, whether it's a, a new medical device, a drug, um, a a social program, a social venture, um, or some kind of technology innovation, really helping them determine whether or not it's worth developing this further, right? So making sure that nobody's wasting their time, money, energy into um, something that's you know might already exist in the market. Um, where there may not be a need in the market, right? Just because something doesn't exist doesn't mean, you know, there is a potential need for it. So helping, helping determine that through primarily secondary research. So looking at um, many of our uh, library sources, subscription databases that um, you as UNC students can access. So I can help you kind of navigate those different resources, but also helping you look at data sets, information, market research reports to determine how does this, how does the information that you found impact your, your own venture? Um, how can you use the information to really make informed decisions? Um, and, you know, going from starting from there, really, you know, one, does this make sense developing further to how we built this out so I can walk you through 
you know, using different uh, entrepreneurship methodologies. You've probably heard, you know, lean startup, um, disciplined entrepreneurship using a structured way to move your venture forward, right? Because it can be a really overwhelming process. Um, so I can help you kind of shed some light on that and make sure there's, you know, there's a, there's a clear path um, to, you know, moving your venture, your project, your idea forward. Um, I think that's it in a nutshell. And there's a whole run, range of other things um, that I do that I could potentially help you with. So I always encourage, you know, just set up a meeting with me, talk to me about what it is that you're working on, and we can kind of develop a plan together um, to, to help you move that forward. Great, thanks, Patrick. Um, Ford, do you want to go up next? Sure. Hi, everybody, Ford Eubanks. Uh, I'm a uh, attorney at Wire Robbins, Yates and Ponton, which is a mouthful, but uh, we're a full service, uh, entrepreneurially focused law firm in Raleigh. Um, my educational background, I actually have three degrees from Carolina, so I'm a big Tar Heel, uh, and take every opportunity to come back into town that I can. Um, I um, have spent all of my uh, legal career focused on startups, and that's, that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I advise clients, uh, founders of companies, um, when they're first starting up, when they're raising money, when they're entering in their first, into their first big contracts and trying to decide what they can and can't uh, agree to, um, when they're considering how they might uh, license others' intellectual property, or if they've developed intellectual property, to license that out. Um, and generally, if they're trying to maintain their corporate governance as they grow as a company. Um, and what's nice and what's fun about what I do is Often I'll start with a client when they're just forming and it's, you know, one or two founders and I will be a part of their organization and an advisor to them um, all the way through to when they're a big company with tons of employees that are is raising money from venture capital, private equity, going to the public markets. Um, often I, I will certainly engage other, other more experienced folks to help at certain times, but but I get to be part of, of that growth over time, and that's a lot of fun for me. Um, I actually started out a long time ago in the entrepreneurship minor at Carolina, um, and so back in the Buck Goldstein days, which uh, I always think of fondly, and I've, I've been involved with uh, the entrepreneurship program at Carolina um, in various capacities ever since. And, uh, and so this is, this is a ton of fun for me still to stay involved and, and offer what I can to support you guys. Um, so the types of things you guys might want to ask me about are, you know, if you're forming a company with one or more folks, uh, what you might do as a choice of entity, whether or not you're going to form as a corporation, whether or not you're going to be a limited liability company, which there are different drivers of why you might want to do that, Compl you know, complicating factors, simplifying factors, costs things and things like that. Um, and if you're trying to figure out how to keep um, your founders, you know, each of you adequately incentivized, I think that, and, and keep everybody honest and working together towards a common goal, I find that to be one of the first big challenges for an organization. And uh, often the, intra the, um, the legal questions that I might pose to a, a set of founders often drive a lot of internal discussions for them on what really matters to them. So if you're doing that, you're very early stage, you've got a group of founders often talking to an attorney about what, how, how to structure that relationship between you guys might cause a lot of necessary conversations to come about that I, in the end can be very healthy for a startup. So that's, that's one of the first things that I, I think I could offer. Great, thanks Ford. And we're glad to have you because that was sort of a gap that we had for I think a semester is someone with legal expertise. And there's, I know students out there have a lot of questions in that category. All right, Myra, you're next. All right, hi everybody. Um, I'm Myra, I'm going into my second year of the sociology graduate program here at UNC. So more of a peer mentor than Patrick and Ford, but still happy to help. Um, and so how I got involved with 1789 was actually through my research. I'm looking into uh, corporate social responsibility trends over the past 15 years. So I started talking to some faculty on campus. Melissa Carrier brought me to 1789 and kind of just got involved from there. So 
um, and signing up to be a mentor, really what I can offer two things, uh, social impact and uh, data visualization, a little bit of help with pitch decks. And I can talk about my experience in both of those. They're a little bit separate. So social impact, um, I've worked with Social Enterprise Alliance for quite a while. They're one of the older social entrepreneurship organizations, although dwindling a little bit in these days. Um, but there's a lot of contacts through that org. So um, there's many social enterprise models you can follow in terms of opportunity employment, innovation through technology. Um, and I wanted to be able to connect students uh, with that network if, if possible. Um, so through that work, and of course, being in the sociology realm, I can help you understand, um, you know, the different social aspects of your venture and how to be inclusive towards all, um, kind of help with that. With data visualization, dashboards, things like that, my expertise comes from working at Walmart e-commerce. Um, I was a category specialist for space heaters, which is very specific and random, but, you know, we worked a lot with the sales through units, inventory, tracking all of that, making forecasting trends. Um, and so for any venture getting started that sells a product, whether it's tangible or, um, you know, an itemized service, I can help you be able to track that and display that information in a really persuasive way to anyone you might be pitching to. Perfect, thank you. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to the students. So if anybody um, has a question that they jotted down, go ahead and raise so your question. I have questions for the other mentors. Well, so take it offline. I know, so actually that's been a really cool uh, a, a bonus of these sessions is that mentors meeting other mentors and being like, oh, we should chat more about that. But uh, when students run out of questions, I usually do turn it over to the mentors to ask questions, so. Oh, yeah, go ahead first to have the students ask some questions and then I'll jump in. All right, students, what do you got? We have three really great categories today. Very different, but really interesting. And I think heavily utilized, or at least people seek help in these three areas a lot. Uh, I have a question for Mira. Sure. Myra, is it Myra? I used to say Mira, but I'm like, no, it's Myra, right? It is Myra, yeah. All right, no okay, Myra, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so for social impact, we hear a lot about nonprofits, but mm -hmm. How do we, how do I as a for-profit business think about trying to make a social impact in my business and incorporating that in my model early on? Mm -hmm. I think that's a great question. I'm glad that you're wanting to do it early on. Can I ask what the business is in a nutshell? <laughs> uh, my business in particular, we tr we're trying to help small businesses become more efficient by giving them access to data analytics and technology. Amazing. I mean, I think just in that framework, you're already doing some sort of social impact by helping smaller businesses. What you might want to make sure you identify more clearly is what those small businesses are doing. Are they nonprofits? Are they led by minority leaders? Are they, um, you know, supporting the community in other ways? And so you can, in a way, measure your impact through their impact. So by providing that data analytics and technology, like how has that increased their efficiency in what they're doing? Um, and so that's one way to communicate it. In terms of incorporating it into your business model early on, um, I mean, really, I've, most of what I've read about and seen in, in business is just having it in your mission statement, having that be part of the core thread of your business so that no matter who's leading it, um, they know that that's what your business like serves a purpose for and it really can come back to any decision making that you go through um, in each round of like business growth if you have that core value that you return to it's really helpful does that answer the question <laughs> yeah thank you cool Who else has a question for um, all the mentors or anything specific to uh, customer discovery, market research? We talk a lot about that and I send a lot of students to Patrick um, or legal um, questions for Ford. Kimmy, I'm not a student, but I have a question. All right, thanks Jackie. <laughs> no problem. 
thank you for opening the, the space for everyone to ask questions because I, I don't feel like anyone ever becomes an expert on something specifically. Um, I have a question for Patrick about the customer discovery. Um, what are some of the questions or just like one of the first three questions you ask people when they come to you um, to, to, you know, just like tell me what I need to do or what do I need to do to, to, to better understand who I'm trying to reach? What are some of those questions that you ask? Um, yeah, the people that, that come and meet with you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, first, first question always, you know, what, what are you working on, right? Just, just want to get them talking and kind of get a sense of what, you know, is this a tangible product? Is this some type of technology? Um, or is this a social venture, right? Just give me the gist. Because um, oftentimes there's parts in there that, you know, I can already parse out. There might be stuff that they weren't even thinking about, right? So just get them talking. The second question is always, what is the problem that you're solving? Or what is the problem that you have, have identified that you think you're solving? And then who is your target market? Who is your beneficiary? Who are you building this for? So really those, those three questions um, are always kind of right out, the, right out the gate, what I want them to start thinking, talking about. Um, and that's typically where I then kind of start engaging with them to kind of think potentially more broadly, or usually, you know, the target markets are not defined enough, they're too broad. So we kind of start thinking about different market subsets using data to kind of really drill down and who your ideal target customer beneficiary uh, really is. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question for Ford. A lot of students um, that come to us very early on are wondering what part of their idea they should and shouldn't share. And even when it's like campus activities like the pitch party and competitions or even seeking advice from mentors, um, can you speak to like when a non-disclosure agreement is necessary and when they could feel a little better about sharing their idea and seeking advice and how to navigate that? Because sometimes I think they feel awkward, like asking a, a mentor to sign something and they don't know if they're supposed to do that. Sure, sure. And that's always, uh, that's a great question. And and not, a, not always a straightforward one. Um, I think a lot of it depends on the, business or the, the venture and, and what uh, what the students going into whether or not um, there is a lot of proprietary information that they can kind of keep to themselves and still explain the idea and still kind of maintain the secret sauce as it is and, and think they can um, disclose things without without being worried that someone's gonna easily replicate what they're doing uh, so if if the idea is in a very low barrier to entry uh, barrier to entry industry, um, and they have some specific, uh, they've de kind of developed a niche that, um, if they were to talk talk a lot about, it would be something that they would be giving up their advantage. Uh, then certainly, I would ask someone to sign an NDA before before sharing that information with them. Um, from a practical perspective you know, blending that in. And, and by the way, being a startup lawyer, you're often, you know, balancing your advice you give as, as an attorney with the advice you'd give to someone who's trying to have a successful startup. And so I often say a lot of things that are scary. And then I say, but, you know, think about it yourself and make a, a, a risk, a, you know, a, a risk acknowledging decision uh, as to what you're, you're willing to share or, or do as a company. Um, so from a pr practical perspective, um, you know, if sharing your idea and gaining interest in it is a very important part of developing the business, then you may decide that, look, I'm in the best position to take advantage of this opportunity. I am pushing hard towards a solution, harder than anyone else will. Even if I share this idea, I'm gonna get the benefit of having shared this idea, getting feedback from people, and I may have others join my effort. I may identify people that I want to help. Um, and if someone wants to try and compete with me, you know, as soon as I start telling people about this business, people will try to compete with me if it's a good idea. I am just gonna do it better than 
if that's the approach you're going to take, then I would not be afraid of sharing your idea. I would simply realize that once you're sharing it, you have to be doing it better and quicker than everybody else. Um, so that said, if you have mentors you're engaging and there is th there are things that you are not sharing in public about your idea uh, that you are sharing with these mentors, I would highly encourage uh, getting you know a basic NDA with these mentors. You know, um, sometimes mentors would be a little skittish around signing them if they're overly uh, restrictive, if they have, you know, broad non-competes or something like that, that, you know, sometimes they don't know what you're going to tell them. And they're like, look, I, I work with 20 different, you know, companies and people trying to start businesses and they're telling me all sorts of different things. And I may want to invest in a few of them at some point. Often mentors are angel investors as well. So you may get some pushback, um, but at least it's worth having a discussion with the mentors. And maybe they say, you know, I've, I've agreed to do, had to have an NDA in the past and uh, it's fairly light, but it will give you some comfort, I hope. You know, here it is, take a look and see if it's okay. And maybe it's very restricted to the industry you're in and maybe not necessarily to, uh, you know, and kind of the niche you're identifying rather than broad strokes. Well, you know, if I if you're in healthcare, I'm not going to be able to do anything in healthcare. I, I'm not willing as a mentor. I wouldn't be willing to sign that. But if you're doing, you know, an app that works with people doing physical therapy, okay, maybe maybe I'm willing to sign an NDA or something around that area. So. Um, it's certainly worth having the discussion with mentors or anybody you're going to share information with that's not going to be, uh, that you wouldn't want shared with everybody or you wouldn't want someone to know who might be wanting to compete with you. Uh, so it's, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a balancing act between managing legal risk and business risk. But I will say from experience, uh, I worked on an ID in undergrad and we were so concerned about someone taking our idea that we were afraid to market it actively. And in retrospect, um, I think I should have been a little less worried about that and more worried about getting my idea in front of people who I thought could help me and at the same time showing that I was the right person to do it. So I think that that might be, that's not my legal hat on, but that's my that's my general advice. Yeah, I'm glad you added that at the end too, because those that were um, around for the last Meet the Mentor session, Arden Rosenblatt from the FBTDC was in the chat and his perspective was like, I mean, uh, with the, the, the exception of anything like IP, but basically it was like, you shouldn't be afraid of sharing it because it's, it's sort of inevitable that it's going to be out there. So you just got to be confident that your idea is better or that you can move it forward faster. Um, but the idea of not putting it out there is um, really not going to help you push it forward at all because you're going to have competition at some point, no matter what. Right, exactly. And a lot of these folks you'll be talking to build their reputation on working with people and then not taking their ideas or competing with them. Right, so right, right. Like for example, me, I don't need to sign that because I'm not going to take any of your ideas and move it forward because they all seem like it, that just would be too hard. My job is just... <laughs> we're also under an implied easier. NDA, Kimmy, we're legally not allowed to take any... Right, ideas. yeah, so the... And I think all the 179 mentors are covered under that. But we, even if I wasn't, really you would fun. never have to worry about me trying to be an entrepreneur because that job seems exhausting right. to me. <laughs> and also anecdotally, you know, going to venture capitalists, this is a big question that people, you know, that have the next big idea, they're trying to go get venture capital funding. It's always the, do I go ask these venture capitalists that I'm pitching to, trying to get them to give me money, do I ask them for an NDA? And the overall advice of, it is if you're trying to get the best venture capitalists to be interested in you, don't ask because they have other people they talk to, other investments. And what they will read this as is you have not looked me up. You have not gotten my bona fides that I have been working with companies for decades. Yes, yeah, so but you don't, don't trust me. Right. Like and, an assumption. And, and, and were I to go, you know, do something over the last 20 years that would would be the disadvantage of people pitching me, I wouldn't have anybody coming to try and get money from me. So yeah. my reputation precedes me on this and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign something that I will come back and 
potentially bite me for reasons you know that I don't even understand right now because I would lose all of the value I've built in my career if I would go you know try and steal your idea right thank you for explaining that Ford um, all right who else has a question um, Eleanor hi guys thank you so much for coming to speak today um, I think something that I'm really interested in is all of you seem to have just very interesting specialties um, that like at some point during the process could cause a pivot in someone's venture. Um, if someone comes to you, um, I'm mainly thinking about like Patrick with your work um, when it comes to data, um, but Ford and Myra, I would love to hear from you too. But when someone comes to you with an idea and they're like trying to work through it, um, how do you start the conversation of like, how about we look at it in like a different way or um, here's a different idea, another way to approach it. Um, especially if like, I just hate like having to tell students like, oh, you know, like no one ever says that's not a great idea, but you always lead with it from like another perspective. Um, when do you think is like an appropriate time to tell that to them? Or like, how do you go about having that conversation with them? Those are a couple of great questions. Um, to answer your first question, I would say, you know, as early as possible, right? Because again, it's all about not wasting time working on something that's not worth developing, right? So um, I have heard a lot of, just like Ford, most likely heard a lot of um, startup ideas. And, you know, you start hearing a recurring theme and then, um, you know, I, I can probably tell pretty early whether or not, you know, this has been tried a lot of times. Um, we have a lot of um, students trying to reach out to local restaurants and small business owners on Franklin Street, right, for some type of uh, platform to engage students more, right? Um, it has been done. Um, there are existing competitors out there. Um, and it's pretty easy for me to just, you know, easily pull a list and show them here, this is your competition right now. Do you really think, you know, this is worth, you know, what, what do you think you can do better? You know, is it, can you, do you have a better network? Uh, can you make it cheaper? Can you make it higher quality? Whatever it may be. Um, but I will have that conversation first. That's why I always ask for, have you done a competitive analysis? Have you looked at the space out there? Do you know if this is a saturated market or not, right? Um, Usually the first response is, well, you know, I've looked, I've done a Google search, really haven't found anything. So I really think, you know, there isn't much out there. So I'm going to help them look at other resources. Um, I'm going to talk about maybe not direct competitors, but, you know, some, some competitor that might be working in an adjacent market, but that would have a really easy time to just kind of attack the same market niche um, or, or vertical. Um, so that's really kind of the first um, advice I would give. And then, you know, I'm always upfront about it, um, but then kind of help them think about what is it that, you know, why, do you, why did you have this um, idea in the first place? What is it that triggered that? Is it something that you're passionate about? Um, or is it something that's based on a specific technology? And then I help them look at other potential market opportunities again by doing a technology analysis, doing a broader market analysis to find alternative use cases for, again, if it's a technology innovation, um, that's it's a bit more straightforward, but if it's uh, a specific market, for instance, or industry that they're passionate about, then we can look at um, other potential um, opportunities that may exist in a given market or industry. Um, Ford or Myra, anything to add about um, when to pivot, how to encourage someone to pivot? When someone comes to talk to me about pivoting, it's often in the context of, um, you know, one of some group of founders wants to go one way and one wants to go the other. And normally we look for kind of the most efficient way to keep everybody happy and aligned and and if not, work, work through that as well. So uh, as far as pivoting ideas, uh, you know, I think it's important that if uh, once, once you realize there is going to be a change, think through the way your organization is organized. And, and if, if a change needs to be made, uh, you know, 
if, if you have someone who's being compensated with equity that, you know, based on the pivot is just going to be wholly unneeded by the business and they acknowledge that, then, you know, make sure that you're going through and, and uh, you know, maybe curtailing that incentive equity if that's what you're doing um, or whatever the case may be. But, you know, often when there's a pivot, the lawyers are the last to know. Uh, so if, uh, if you can let, let them know a little sooner, that's always better too. I'll just add, I think I echo a lot of what Patrick said in terms of asking more questions to kind of get to the root of their line of thinking. But if it's an instance where they're trying to solve a problem and you're thinking that maybe this isn't the right solution, I would just say always encourage them to go back to the problem and understand it more deeply, talk to more people. Um, of course, look at other solutions that are already out there in terms of market competitors. But um, you know, really reworking that with either a human design perspective or, um, you know, systems analysis, looking at all the different players and exploring other ways that they could solve the same problem if that's the original goal. Thank you. And um, you, Yeo, correct me if I said it wrong, but I think you have a question for the group. Oh, thanks, Kimmy. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I'm an incoming first year, really interested in entrepreneurship. And I was wondering how can you better allocate your time on entrepreneurship? And I often heard that if your first product is perfect, uh, then you're releasing it kind of late. So I was wondering what's the perfect time to uh, release or launch your venture and how to allocate your time as a student. That's a good one. Who wants to start? I feel like the mentors could comment on this. And then I also feel like um, some of the current ventures that are current students that are not uh, first years, but they're already in the CUBE cohort could maybe speak to how they have juggled their time with classes, extracurriculars, but still pushing forward with their idea. Yeah, I can really comment on, on that part, you know, as a student, um, entrepreneurship, you know, can easily be a full time job. So knowing that, you know, being a student at Carolina, you know, especially, you know, early on first first year, second year, I mean, you're gonna be incredibly busy, right, just juggling your, your co coursework and extracurriculars and whatnot. So it's that's really where it comes down to you need to be passionate about what you're pursuing your your entrepreneurial pursuits if it's just kind of an afterthought and something that you you thought about maybe you know looking into i think it's it's not going to be successful you know that's why it's really find something that you know you're passionate about whether that's a again a specific industry that you love is this a, if it's in sports or design wherever it might be but find something that you can really dive into where you know you've had heard this thrown around but you know where it's it doesn't really feel like work it's just something that you that you enjoy doing and i think that's that's a really important uh piece of this um does any mentor have anything to add about when to release your first you know product or version one um, he said he's heard that if if what you put out the first time is perfect, then you waited too long. So can anyone speak to when um, to start getting that version one out for others to see or to use, depending on what it is? Um, I, I deal with a lot of clients in the in the medical and med, med tech space and uh, as part of that, I have a lot of clients putting out beta software and, uh, you know, in the medical space, that's a scary prospect because you have a lot of people depending on you for that software. Um, and if I'm honest from a lawyer's perspective, sometimes I'm surprised at the willingness to go with a medical beta release, not knowing how everything's going to play out. And what, I, what I'll say to that is, um, I think in the end, so many valuable lessons were learned. If you find the right partners to, to release, to do a first release with, uh, that it, 
is definitely worth taking on the risk that things won't be perfect when you release them. So uh, what I'd say to that is, um, I think it's as much about finding who you're gonna release an early version to. And you know, if you're gonna have a quote, first adopter or adopters, make sure you're not just releasing it to everyone, telling them that it's perfect, you know, find a select group to release it to that will give you the feedback you need and deserve because they're getting kind of a first look and probably a, a bit of a better deal than other people might get. So, you know, I would work through the release and make sure it's that the company, you know, that, that your company is getting the benefit of the beta while not overselling what the beta is. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I wanted to add a little bit to to the question that was just asked. I, I know I'm not a, one of the mentors, but I went to UNC um, and definitely of the entrepreneurial spirit and now work at UNC. And so I was just going to say to that question is when we think about entrepreneurship, sometimes you're just like, oh, I have to look at the Innovate Carolina newsletter or I have to be part of the e-minor or the business school. And from my experience at Carolina, one of the rich things that exist there is just so many opportunities to do anything and everything. Um, and I hear what Patrick was saying about like, it has to be something you're passionate about. I was really passionate about speaking Spanish and being an immigrant. And, you know, I first, my first step was like really making sure that what I was studying and what I was dedicating so many hours to at Carolina was something that was aligned to the work that I was trying to do. So I first started off as a poli sci major. I was like, no, the, the, this content is a lot about US institutions. I want global. So I started exploring classes at the global studies. And so it just became a part of my journey trying to figure out what I wanted to study. And then I applied for research fellowships, which sometimes you think that, you know, that's not entrepreneurial, but I mean, that's customer discovery. That's learning more about the market. And so I started applying to research fellowships, classes that interested me in that way. And kind of what Patrick was saying, it becomes your life. <laughs> so like, it's very strategic to, to try to find a way to like make the pieces come together. So that was just my journey speaking on I statements of like piecing together the fellowships and opportunities across campus to help me build the venture um, and, and not just build a venture, but learn more about what I was passionate about. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Jackie. I think that's really important. Um, go out and find the different pieces across campus that um, that really speak to you. Don't let anyone say like, you should do A, then B, then C. You can kind of create it. Um, and you can worry about how you're gonna explain that thing that looks crazy on a resume later um, when you you know, are creating cover letters or going on interviews and you can really put words around all those different experiences. Um, in fact, that's some of the most diverse um, candidates that we've had like at Innovate Carolina for internship opportunities and such are students that have done quite a variety of things um, in their past. And can really speak to how, you know, why they did that and, and why they were passionate about that and sort of create your own experience on campus. Oh, Jessica submitted a question. Um, but before we leave this one, I wanted to open it up for any of the current uh, UNC students that are maybe sophomores, juniors, or seniors, so they've had a little bit more experience juggling, like, how am I going to do something with this idea that I have? How am I going to build a venture, but also, like, pass these classes and everything else that acclimating to UNC brings? Does any uh, student want to talk about that? I can share um, my experience with that. I think something that I learned is that people have different styles of time management and how they work. And so some people want to spend a little bit of time every day. Some people want to work in big chunks of time. I'm one of the people who likes to find big chunks of time to work. And so it really depends on your venture and deadlines and what exactly you have going on, but trying to figure out what works best for you um, and recognizing that as a student, not every single day you're going to be able to work on your venture. There are going to be times, um, even weeks if you're in midterms and finals where you can't focus on your venture, but trying to make sure that you do have some sort of a plan um, for when you can devote that time is something that at least worked for me. Great. Thank you, Jessica. Because I know that's, I could imagine that struggle. I mean, even just as um, 
a 17 I mentor and, and chatting with many of you and, and working with student clubs there there really is an ebb and flow like sometimes students are really 110 percent and then sometimes they kind of disappear for a little bit and I think it's just because of what Jessica mentioned I mean the different priorities come up but as long as you can block some time to stay focused and keep it moving forward um, and then Jessica you had a question for the mentors a good one Yes, yeah, so um, something I've been hearing a lot about is how as a student you have a lot of advantages because people want to help you, but also when you're trying to promote what you're doing and talk about it, sometimes it might feel like people might not take you as seriously if you're a student, and so I was just wondering how to best balance that. Can I ask what people you specifically might feel um, would kind of challenge your abilities? Is there a certain group? So in um, my venture is I'm writing and publishing a book about environmental communication and I'm um, donating the money to environmental nonprofits. And so when I'm trying to get the book out to different organizations to be able to read and use the books, I would love for them to recognize that this is coming from a student's viewpoint, but I also don't want them to take that as not being credible. I mean, do you mind if I chime in? I would love for you to chime in. So Nancy is another 1789 mentor. You can so sort of explain why. Um, yeah, you probably have a great answer to this. Yeah, so I'm the entrepreneurship librarian and just called in to, to hear what y'all are chatting about. But in answer to your question, Jessica, like knowing, knowing your stuff and just speaking speaking from a place of confidence, I think which if the whole like fake it till you make it thing is so true that I am fairly early career. Um, I've been at UNC for about two years and so I'm working with faculty who may have been work teaching at UNC for 30 years and so trying to present myself as like here I am, I'm an equal partner with you in, in teaching and so the like coming to it, faking it till I, till I make it, you know? So that's what's worked for me yeah. in, Thank my, you. in my ex work experience. But then as you are pitching and do it, yeah, knowing your stuff, I think is. Yeah. It can be hard. Advice. Yeah, and practicing, like any of us are like happy to sit with you and, and, and hear you practice your, your conversation and, and things like that. Yeah, and think about what they might have any doubts on and make sure to include that in your pitch. Like if they're worried about the accuracy of the information you're portraying, like be sure to include the courses you've taken with the professors who've, you know, published about this topic. So you, you know, having, demonstrating that credibility in a way that maybe you don't feel confident enough yourself to portray, but you can at least back it up with other information that you have and you are empowered with. And sort of get ahead of them questioning it by putting that in ahead of time. Yeah. And I think at the end of the day, I mean, that's true for any venture, for anything that you, you're promoting, right? If you don't instill confidence, if you don't show them that you know your stuff, right? And this is why, you know, I urge the students that I'm working with to do all that research, to really know is this a about, you know, is this a real problem? Is there a market opportunity for this, right? Because if I can convey that, it doesn't matter whether I'm a, I'm a first year student or I'm a 30, 34 year old guy that's, you know, building his 15th venture, right? It, it's the same thing. I need to show that I know what I'm talking about, right? I need to present the data, I need to present the information. Yeah, and I think in um, her case and many other cases, not only do you have to make sure that you're saying like, like she's saying this book addresses a problem. So she needs her audience to um, buy that there is a problem. But then additionally, that like her book is legit and it can work to solve that problem is like a, sep a second thing that is a battle I feel like she has to fight, which happens with, you know, a lot of pieces of software and other things. It's, it's like almost like the validity of it coming into question. 
One more thing. And Jessica, I, would... I remember, sorry if I. No, go ahead. Patrick. I remember um, you pitched as part of the 1789 Venture Fund competition, correct? Yes. That's right. Um, you know, what, what triggered you? What, what made you write this book, right? Like, what was it? Is it a certain experience that you had? And then, you know, talk about the amount of research that you've done and just, you know, position yourself as a subject matter expert on this specific uh, area that you wrote about. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, especially because I'm like, I mean, I don't, I, I read your application for the venture fund too, but I'm like pretty sure that most of the people, I mean, at least in that, in that scenario, um, probably knew less on the topic than you. Now you might be pitching this book to people that are, you know, in more specific fields. And maybe that's why you're feeling a little more intimidated because they probably have more knowledge in that content area than we did at 1789. Um, but yeah, like Patrick said, just positioning yourself as the expert. One more thing I'd say is to kind of flip any weakness that you see on its head. So you can use your demographic as a student to your advantage because the people you're pitching to probably aren't in that demographic anymore. Do you understand how to communicate things in a layman way um, and reach a broader audience that they might not be able to tap into? So, you know, something they might see as a weakness is really an advantage in a particular market. Um, does anybody have one last question? Uh, hi, uh, I have another question, which is a kind of rookie question. But when you are building a startup, how to create a successful team? And what kind of uh, proportion you should have, uh, like your role in idea? Like, for example, I heard that it's better if you are in a technical role, so you're kind of irreplaceable. However, if you're just kind of being creative and just being management style, it might be not that helpful. So how to build a successful team and what kind of role should I take if I want to be a successful, successful venture? I'm so glad you asked that one because that's where I was hoping we would go because all three of you have been on various teams in your life and you've also worked with various teams. So um, what advice do you have? What teams have you seen that worked really well together um, or what did what does not work? Ford, do you want to start off? Absolutely. I was taking notes here because that's a really good one. <laughs> so I, I've been on a lot of different teams either to, to work through a venture or uh, as, a, as working with investors, um, or, and now I get to see a lot of founder teams come to me for advice and I get to see which ones are successful and which ones are not. And what I will say, what I see out of the most successful teams is that they all have a common goal and they've established what this common goal is and it may shift over time, but they've all agreed that this is their goal to create this company. But it honestly works better if they kind of all have different approaches to it. Um, you know, if everyone thinks the same way about every situation, then often, you know, you can get blinders on, you can have group think. It's great to have different perspectives and attitudes and even different work dynamics. And that can sometimes lead to communication difficulties from time to time. But overall, I think it, it yields a better overall venture. So, um, but, but all the same, everyone needs to be able to look at each other at the end of the day and go, we're all working towards the common goal here. And you can come to agreement on that, even if your different approaches, the situations are different. So, um, and then you asked what role to be, um, you know, I, this, uh, what role to be on a team to be more valuable in a venture. Um, I think as a founder, you wear every hat. And so you need to be able to be, uh, you know, proficient in the technical roles of your company. You need to be able to put on the management hat as needed. You need to be able to go sell. You need to be able to, to, to you know, manage the documents behind the business, or whatever it is. So you need to be able to wear every hat. And as you develop your venture, you'll figure out what you're good at. You'll bring people onto your team that are good at other things, uh, you know, that you're not, not as good at. And, and I think whatever role develops best for you, over that time is the role that you're, you can 
best perform in the long term for your business. Often we have a lot of brilliant founders that come in and work with us and you hear their ideas and you're blown away and you know what they're doing and then over the course of working with them for a year or so you realize wait they're wonderful with their ideas they're a great chief technology officer but they need a manager so i will say that over time your role will, sh will shift and you should be you should go with them great thanks ford um anybody else have anything to add about team building patrick yeah, I think the only thing I would I would add is that um, I wouldn't necessarily just, you know, look at friends and family to bring on my team just because you know them and they have, you know, remote expertise in some areas. It's really about what they can bring to the team, what level of expertise is needed for the stage that your business is in, right? Um, see a lot of students that, you know, just bring in a friend from class that they've met and they kind of like the idea. Um, while that might work for maybe the first couple of weeks, you know, once the things get serious, uh, it's, it's just not a good idea. Um, I've seen plenty of uh, fights break out between friends and friendships ended after um, a not so successful venture uh, tanked. So just one little advice I can give. All right, well that about wraps up our time. I did wanna, um show you all where on the Innovate Carolina website that these recordings live. I'll put this link in the chat right now. Um, but this um, Innovate Now series really summarizes everything that we've done over the summer. Um, so for students, um, there's another session that Patrick did and something on customer discovery and company evaluation. Um, and then 1789 Meet the Mentor sessions are all listed here and you can watch those back. If there's a particular individual um, that you want to learn a little bit more about or hear from, but remember you can email all of the mentors and ask to have a one-on-one -on -one chat and they will schedule something with you. Um, and if you're not a 1789 mentor, member yet, um, please fill out the application on 1789hub.com and we will be, I think there's a virtual orientation happening this week, um, but we'll be doing orientations regularly once classes get started and I get my team of interns back to help me out. So um, I also want to let you know that I plan on continuing the Meet the Mentor sessions as well throughout the fall semester once I get that team of interns back. Um, instead of doing it every other week, I think we'll do it probably like once a month and I'd like to get that kicked off in September. So please um, be on the lookout for more information and mentors, I'll be shooting everyone an email to try to block some time on your calendar uh, just for one other session in the fall semester. So thank you so much for joining us and um, you know giving us an hour of your day. I think this is really helpful. Um, it's, it's definitely helpful for me and some other staff, as you can see, that still sign in. So thanks Jackie and um, Nancy for joining us. Um, and, I, and I know for sure it's helpful for the students. Yes, Tyrell, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I was wondering, could we get Ford's email Oh, right, because I didn't update the website with it. Yes. <laughs> Ford, do you want to throw your email in that chat? Exclusive sure. access to Ford, to Ford Eubank's contact information right now before, so get your legal questions in before uh, this WordPress site, before I figure out how to update our WordPress site. <laughs> thank you, Kimmy. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, take care, everyone. All, All right. right, bye, everyone. Have a great day. You too. Sure. Bye. We'll be sending out notes as well, and I'll leave this so you can grab his email. Okay, bye. Hi, Kimmy. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so I, I was trying to fill in out the uh, 1789 application. Do yeah. You have to be, do you have to have a venture to join? No, you don't. So I'm glad you asked. 1789 is for all students interested in innovation entrepreneurship. So some of the students have ventures. And in that case, on your application, you would choose like venture and you'd put in the, all the details of your current venture. But if right now you're just interested in innovation entrepreneurship, you think you might want to work at a startup, you think you might want to join another team, or you just didn't build your venture yet, you can apply as an individual member. And then you'll just be filling out the application. I think it's just one 
one simple question, then it just says like, why are you interested in innovation and entrepreneurship? So you could just put something there and um, yeah, it's, it's welcome to, to everyone. So you'll see some different events popping up in the fall where hopefully we can just kind of hang out with each other, get to know each other, network and build that community, but I'll also plug you into some different content like the eShip Center will be having speaker series and I'll make sure you learn all about the pitch party that's coming up. Um, if you do have an idea, you can still like participate in all of those things, but you don't have to like apply to 1789 as a venture. Uh, so it's the same application form? Um, the application, yeah, it's the same application form. I think it's just somewhere, let me, I think somewhere it just says, do you have a current venture like in that same application? And I think you can just say no. Oh, so you, you, you don't have to have a venture yet? No, correct. Okay. You can say, uh, I, ha I have an idea, but not a venture yet, or. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it can just be really general for now. Um, and then later, if you have a venture, you can give us all the details. How did you hear about this event? Uh, I'm really interested in startups. And I kind of, when I was deciding between schools, I was, yeah, browsing through all the uh, amazing opportunities. There's so many, and I'm so glad that Carolina's really emphasized a lot about in, uh, innovation. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad you could join us. And yeah, my job is just sort of to support and connect all the people and students and programs involved in this. So I know there's sort of a lot to shift through, but if you have any questions, just shoot me an email and we can like schedule a chat and I can sort of point you in the right direction. But right now is there's about to be a lot coming out just about different events and stuff for the fall. So just try to come to whatever you can. I think it's mostly going to be virtual. So that's a little bit different, but just try to log in and, and uh, hope to see at more events and meetings and things. Yeah, definitely. And I heard that there's a orientation coming up. Well, where can I see it? So once you um, let me look. It's my intern that's doing it, and I think it might be today. I could even just send you the registration link. Wow. I actually signed up for the uh, the email, but I haven't received anything. So I was just wondering. Yeah. You sign up for the Innovate Carolina newsletter? Yes. So that comes every Monday afternoon. So it is the same with the 1789 Hub? Um, okay, yeah. So so my office is Innovate Carolina. See how my little symbol says like 1789 hub powered yeah. by Innovate Carolina. So it's a little bit confusing. Um, so Innovate Carolina is the office. 1789 hub is like the student community that I run from that office. Does that make sense? It's like a program. Yes. So I okay. refuse to make a, a specific newsletter because our communications team is great at it. And I don't want to just like, redo something that they already do so yes you sign up for the innovate carolina newsletter even though you're a 1789 member now that innovate carolina newsletter is going to include more stuff than just student stuff but still it'll be nice for you to see like what's going on on campus even if faculty have cool ideas you know yeah Okay, so it looks like this um, 1789 orientation is on uh, next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Would that happen to work for you? Yeah, I'm pretty okay. free since I just graduated. Yeah. <laughs> pretty free this summer, huh? Nothing going on either. I just put a link in the chat so you can click that and register and then make sure, sure you finish, um, make sure you fill out that membership form. This, All right. This membership form. And then once you do those two things, you'll learn a lot more at that um, at that virtual orientation next Wednesday with uh, my intern. Her name is Shiva. All right. And then let me know after that if you're like, OK, I have a question about something or something doesn't make sense. OK. All right. Thank All you. All right. Well, so it was nice to help. meet you. You're welcome. Yeah, have a great, have a great day. day. Bye.